Hello everyone, welcome back to the History Connection Podcast. I'm Michael Musangu, a student at the University of Portland studying biology and minoring in history. Today, before we get started on our episode of Unsung Heroes, let us go into some food for thought. This quote comes from Benjamin Franklin, an American founder. He says that without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. Let me read that once more. He says that without freedom of thought, there can be no such thing as wisdom and no such thing as public liberty without freedom of speech. I feel like this episode, or not really this episode, but this quote specifically is very fitting to a lot of the things that we're seeing today, especially with just how it seems like people don't recognize that freedom of thought allows for public discourse to occur when there is no freedom of thought then literally there is no freedom the ability for us to think for ourselves and to make our own decisions and to be able to disagree with each other is what makes our societies great because that's how we progress actually there is less progression i would think when we are only allowed to subscribe to one school of thought but we're actually but we're actually forced to subscribe to one school of thought, and that's actually what makes progression less. I would like to think that with freedom, as Benjamin Franklin says here, with freedom of thought, that is where wisdom lies. And you cannot have liberty unless you have that freedom of thought. Anyways, I thought that was a pretty neat quote. I hope you liked it as well. But Without further ado, let us go ahead and go into our episode of Unsung Heroes. Today we are dealing with an American hero who is not spoken of very often. He is a founder, and I would like to shed more light on his story because he is known as the man who really founded, or I should say funded, the Revolutionary War. And his name is Robert Morris. Now, Morris himself was born in Liverpool, England in January 1734 to Robert Morris Sr. and a woman named Elizabeth. Now, the reason he was just born to a woman named Elizabeth here is that actually he was the product of a, a uh, out-of-wedlock union, so to speak. Um, he was mainly raised by his maternal grandmother, and as a result of his father's um, shipping company keeping him away, he really never really had much time to hang out with his father as a really young boy. But um, and this is because his father actually established a successful um, shipping business, escorting or escorting, but rather exporting tobacco from Maryland. So actually, the older he got, he actually um, moved to Maryland to actually work with his father and to kind of be his apprentice in the business. He was eventually transferred to Philadelphia, where he studied under a man named Charles Greenway, as a member of the Library Company of Philadelphia, which was actually created by Benjamin Franklin himself. In 1750, there was a freak accident that took the life of his father, and basically 16-year-old Robert found himself as an inheritor of some 2,500 pounds sterling. So, therefore, he spent several years in the trading industry, doing some learning under a man named Charles Willing, who was a former partner of his father. And he learned quickly. He picked up a lot of... um, mathematics skills and and learn how to um, do business ledgers very quickly and he became proficient at such a level that he started to be noticed and his um, and the man who took him under his wing Charles started to become really close with him as well they became good friends so politically and socially uh, Charles started to provide Robert with a platform that would end would that would eventually uh, culminate in a partnership called the Willing and Morris the Willing Morris and Company now, that said, it became quite successful because they did a, um, a lot of methods that essentially allowed them to monopolize the industry. In fact, Robert Morris is considered America's first capitalist, and the reason that is is because his company was super successful. They basically made sure, Willing and Morris and their partnership, that they would basically get all the cargo vessels... Um, all the cargo vessels that are pursuing the Mediterranean and tr- uh, that are pursuing trade in the Mediterranean and in India, they they basically open these markets to Philadelphia and North America. So basically, 
it opened markets to all the other businesses, but it basically made them wealthy because they were spearheading these um, efforts of directing business in their way. Very, they were very shrewd businessmen, and and they dealt with primarily merchant goods. But there were all there was in this time period, of course, since the since the transatlantic slave trade was going on, there was also dealing in African slaves as well on occasion. But in 1763, um. Moving past this time period of when Morris finally uh, opened the business with Willing here. In 1763, Morris fathered a daughter out of wedlock in Philadelphia. Um, and her name was Polly, if I'm correct. And with this daughter named Polly, he had actually paid for her living for most of her life until she got married, etc. But um, he did father a daughter out of wedlock here. And in 1769, Morris eventually did marry a woman named Mary White, and she was the daughter of a wealthy lawyer, and they would eventually have seven children together. But in the years leading up to the American Revolution, Morris found himself on the opposing side of the whole American-British conflict and was really against British taxes on merchant goods. But then again, you know, being a... A businessman and a trader. I mean, who doesn't want more? T I mean, who does want more taxes? Am I right? Like, who really wants to be taxed more? But again, he was on the B American side, who was opposing British taxes on merchant goods. He actually opposed the 1765 Stamp Act and any measures that would cause a burden upon American shipping vessels. Again, one could say that he was just opposing this because it was for his benefit. Of course, everyone has interests involved here. During the, during the First Continental Congress in Philadelphia in 1774, Morris was not elected as a delegate yet. Even though he wasn't elected as a delegate, one could tell that with the type of respect that he has as a person, he was actually being, um, he, he actually was being consulted about. And actually many members of the delegation sought his opinion on how to petition for the repeal of the intolerable acts in England. In fact, Morris was so respected that um, he was actually um, appointed to the Committee of Safety in 1775, following the outbreak of the American Revolution in Massachusetts. Morris was also given the task of providing munitions and gunpowder to the Continental Army, something that he actually eventually did with a lot of success. This got him a subsequent nomination to the Second Continental Congress the following year. And Morris tried to mediate the call for independence. Um, he, he basically tried to mediate the call for independence, uh, but basically saying, look, independence is not something I think we should do right now. Basically, he was thinking, let's negotiate with the British more instead of going straight to war. His idea was actually being neutral and petitioning the king for some mercy or for some compromising type ground where no no blood has to be shed and you know that said regardless of this you know the war did happen and other things would happen here as well his reputation as a successful as a successful merchant actually led to him being elected to several committees that oversaw the necessity in using maritime shipping and aiding the american cause while doing it at the same time. In fact, he was actually the man who founded the Continental Navy, again, because his funding was able to help a lot of the American cause. But again, in 1776, when there was the vote for independence that was going on um, in the months of June and July of 1776, he, he refused to vote for independence, and he actually preferred negotiations, as I mentioned, as opposed to all-out war. Therefore, he, actually he was one of the members who abstained from the official vote. Therefore, abstaining from the official vote also allowed the state of Pennsylvania, or the colony of Pennsylvania at the time, to vote for independence. He would actually eventually sign the document in August 1776 with the majority of Congress. And he is quoting at he is quoted as saying during the signing here that the duty of every individual to act his part in whatsoever station his country may call him to in, owl, in, in hours of difficulty, danger, and distress. But that said, the war for independence did cause a lot of financial struggles. And essentially, with the new government that the American colonists had set up in the 1770s, 
via the Articles of Confederation. It essentially allowed Congress to request funds from the state, but didn't require the states to comply. Therefore, with all the states being in war, most of them were going to be like, um, no, I don't want to donate any funds to this. Thank you very much. We have our own problems. This caused a lot of troops to go for months without pay, and it forced the U.S. to beg European allies and states for more loans. In fact, it got to such a point where literally a lot of states were actually, uh, or a lot of military men who were not getting paid were thinking of just quitting. But it required documents that Thomas Paine wrote like, common sense and uh, the other document with the famous words of these are the times that try men's souls it required documents like these to really invigorate them and actually help washington keep them again because it got to such a point where they couldn't move on but robert morris came to the rescue because when they were on the brink of economic ruin, Congress actually appointed Morris as the superintendent of finance, which was the government's very first executive office. The superintendent of finance is really akin to what we call today the secretary of the treasury. So Morris was really the first secretary of the treasury. Actually, in fact, in 1789, when Washington was forming his first government, he actually asked Robert Morris to become the first secretary, of, the first U.S. secretary of the treasury. In fact, he did decline, and therefore, Alexander Hamilton was actually nominated, and then he accepted the position, becoming the first U.S. secretary of the treasury. Moving on, though, he was elected, Robert Morris, that is, to the, um, to the, confeder er, to the confederation's first executive office. That said, Morris in this office had a lot of powers that were essentially unchecked. He did leverage a lot of business contracts in the shipping world to get supplies and ammunition. And he also borrowed a lot of, a lot of money in the millions of dollars backed by his promissory notes. This said, he also did not do this all alone. He actually worked with a man called Haim Solomon to fund the cause as well. That said, when Washington needed gunpowder, Morris did smuggle it past the British blockades. And when the Continental Army needed ships, Morris actually supplied three of his own personal mercantile ships as well. When the, con when the, uh, when the separate currencies of, of the American states collapsed, Congress paid the troops and bought supplies using the system called Morris Notes. Now, his own fortune was on the line, but trade overseas allowed him to create a lot of good profits. And yet, after the revolution was over, he was elected one of the first senators of Pennsylvania. And during this time, it was actually that many started to question whether he had financed the revolution or did the revolution finance him. Again, he had all the power to make decisions as the f superintendent of finance to himself. As a result, no doubt, there was a lot of business deals that he was able to sign on his own, seeing that he had the ability to make out these large loans on behalf of the, con of, on the, of the Articles of Confederation, I should say. That said, he um, eventually was brought into investigation in 1785, and Congress passed a resolution to do this investigation. And basically, they just wanted to investigate him because a lot were calling to see, hey, this man is too rich. Like, where's... So that means the office that we gave him basically made him rich. And many didn't understand this. So they did investigate him. Though nothing came out of it, they could not prove his guilt. In 1790, the question came up once more. And an investigation did happen. But again, it, they pro it proved that he wasn't guilty. In 1790, or rather not in 1790, but after leaving politics, he went back to operating um, his own financial ventures. I mean, that this is what he was good at. He was a shrewd businessman. He opened a silkworm operation and um, a maple sugar trade. In fact, he also gambled in real estate a lot. Actually, after the whole American Revolution thing was over, he essentially is like, okay, there's going to be an influx of immigrants coming to the U.S. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to buy 6 million acres of land 
and basically I expect a profit to come out of this because I'll own the land so it'll be flipped and people will move on to it and 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 develop it etc etc and I'll become rich and everything's gonna be great unfortunately that didn't work as he planned obviously because there were actually very few immigrants that came after the American Revolution due to the outbreak of the French Revolution in France, you know, just a small problem going on there. So as a result, there was a small, small influx of people and therefore it caused him to go into such debt. He went into such debt actually that he was on the hook or so to speak, or he was required to pay some $3 million dollars in 1790s money now this this price is actually unimaginable in that time period three million dollars i i wish i did the conversion actually when i was doing the research for this episode i wish i did because it sounds like a crazy amount but essentially he was on the hook for some three million dollars in 1790s money in debt and because there were no laws governing how people should deal with debt back then with the new government under the american constitution if you were in debt and you couldn't pay your debts, you were thrown into debtor's prison until you could pay your debts. And how do you pay your debts when you're in debtor's prison? That's a question I never understood. Anyways, he was thrown into debtor's prison for three years and was eventually released. But though he was released, he basically had to liquefy everything. All his access that he had, he had to liquefy them. So essentially, he was released from prison and left in not in poverty, but he was left way poorer than the extravagant lifestyle he had earned living at as a merchant or as the profession he was in. He actually left prison living out the rest of his five years alone with his wife and children humbled on their little farm. And he unfortunately passed away in May 1806. And because his reputation was so ruined due to his financial struggles in the 1780s and 90s actually in local papers after his death he only got a five line obituary it is unfortunate that he had such a sad ending to his life but that said he did do a lot to help the cause of the american revolution and it's because of this that we actually saw a lot of progression into who, into what America was today. Of course, America could have borrowed from other governments, but there was no way to show collateral. But Robert Morris was the man who really offered America a lot of options as to extending their ability to be able to have men, munitions, ships. He created the first continent, uh, continental Navy, all these other things that allowed America to become successful or spearhead a lot of what allowed America to become successful in helping them to gain these crucial allies like France and Spain in the American Revolution. Anyways, I hope this episode was interesting to you. I thought it was quite interesting. And because of this, you know, um, just thinking about this, you know, there, there, there are a lot of people who go unsung in the American Revolution. I, I do hope to do more episodes on people in the American Revolution because the, a lot of them go Un, unspoken of. I mean, we always hear of the George Washingtons, Thomas Jeffersons, James Madisons, Alexander Hamiltons, but I would like to speak of people more like Joseph Warren, whom we discussed in our in our first Unsung Heroes episode, um, like Samuel Adams and other players like that, key players like them, John Hancock, etc. Because these are people who who did make significant impacts. John Jay, for example, the first U.S. Supreme Court justice. I mean, they they did make major impacts. It's just we don't hear about them. Therefore, I hope that I hope that oh, in the future we would be able to do this. Anyways, I thought this episode was quite interesting. I hope you found it interesting as well. And until next time, I'm Michael Musongo, and this is the History Connection Podcast. See you next time.